Today, uh, we're going to be talking about linked list stacks and if we get to it, queues. So, there's going to be some helpful knowledge uh, for a lot of the things that, are, that we're going to be talking about today. Um, if you've taken Comp 308, then we're going to be talking about the difference between like, abstract data types versus concrete data types. Um, if you're taking Comp 250, uh, then knowing about how the computer actually member manages memory in a stack or how pointers work might be sort of helpful. Uh, and if you've taken Comp 230, then there's one problem where knowing how modular arithmetic works also sort of helps. But fear not, if you don't have this foreknowledge, we're going to still talk about it beforehand. It's just that if you already had it down pat beforehand, then it might be like you know even faster for you to go through. So the other thing that I want to say before we start today is that there are a lot of slides today. Um, I don't know if you all have checked on the course website. These slides have already been posted. But we're not getting through all like 100 whatever slides today. Um, that we're, that's going to be split between this week and next week. We're going to try to get as far as we can today. And then whatever we don't finish, we'll wrap up next week. Uh, we're going to take a lot of time on this because we, I think that this is a very, very important topic to cover. Um, because it's something that like you cover pretty early on in most data structures classes. So even people who have like just gotten started can sort of start answering these questions. But as you'll soon see, the difficulty can really quickly ramp up, even though these are very basic data structures. So the first thing that we're going to be talking about is a singly linked list, right? So these singly linked lists are what you most commonly think about when you think of linked lists. They are made up of nodes, as you can see over there. And each node has a data pointer, um, which is like what data the linked list actually contains, and then a next pointer, which points to another node inside of a linked list. So data can be of any sort of type. In our examples, we'll stick to it being integers, uh, just because it's easiest to reason about and to be consistent with one data type. But you can store strings, pointers, characters, whatever you want in them. And the next pointer is always either null or a pointer to another linked list node. Um, our diagrams will show the next as an error pointing to either nothing or to another node. So an important concept is that when you're given access to a singly linked list, you're given access via a head. If you're given access to a head, then you can access everything that is after it in a linked list, um, which is really simple in a lot of cases. Um, but it's also really limiting in others, uh, because it sort of limits like what you can know. Um, one example of this is that there might be stuff before your head in a singly linked list, and you have no idea of knowing about that. You don't know what possibly points to an existing node, you only know what it points towards. Another corollary of this is that many nodes can point to one single node, however one node can't have multiple next pointers. Right? So think of this as like a very, very restricted data type, but still something that we can do a lot of interesting things with. So, Let's look at a sample code snippet, right? You'll see that um, we define a class node which has an int data and a node next. Um, and we have two ways of counting the length of a linked list here. Can anyone tell me why one of them is better than the other? Yeah, sure. <clears throat> well, in the second one, you create another pointer to the head, so you don't lose access to the head in the second. Yeah, exactly. So count link two is better for exactly the reason on um, that. What's your name? Jared. That Jared stated. So both of them still use like O of one extra space. They both take O of n time to go through. But like we said on the previous slide, like you have no idea what's going on before the head, right? So if you lose access to the head, you lose access to whatever was before it in your overall linked list that you were given. So that's why in a lot of cases it's really important for you to not mutate the input and to define a separate traverser node that you can use to actually go through the list with. If at any time you have questions, by the way, feel free to stop me. Um, this is a very, this is supposed to be as interactive, of course, as you can get. Like, I'm just a student, just like all y'all, like, feel free to chime in with whatever. <clears throat> so let's start off with a really simple coding exercise, right? So this is just returning the middle of a singly linked list. Let's get to it. So there's a couple of ways for you to do this. So over here, uh, we have a class that we call a linked list problem, right? And we have um, this thing called this node, and we're just going to define it such as this is just going to set up our node to just be um, valid whenever you first initialize it. So I've also had a couple of um, accessory methods that I've sort of typed up beforehand. This prints the list, and this gives you the length of the list. This is exactly the same as um, the code that you would see inside. Um, this right over here. So 
if we run this right now, then what you'll see is, well, I already ran it beforehand, but basically what you see is right there, right? So I declared nodes A, B, and C. I said that A's next is B, B's next is C, and then I printed the list, and then I print out the length of the list. So all of our accessory methods are working. Let's get to defining, let's get to uh, what we can do in terms of getting to the middle of the list, right? So let's define this public stack node uh, middle, and you're given access to a node head. So what might be a really like naive way to do this with what we already have, for example, the length methods. Yeah? So if I find the length divided by two, and that will be a middle, and then just keep the counter to finally reach that middle value? Yeah, that's perfect. That works out just the way that you would want it, right? Um, so one thing that you might want to note is that uh, the middle of a length list is uh, going to be of an odd number, of an odd length length list, is going to be like the number divided by two, but actually rounded up. Uh, whereas in most languages, you would like divide by two and then round down, right? So there's another way for us to do this, actually. Uh, note that one of the goals is to do it in only one pass of the list. So this requires two passes, right? You need to go through the entire list once, and then you divide the number, you divide the length by two, and then you go through the list again like half that amount of time. Is there any way that we could do this like in one fell swoop? Yeah. Okay, yeah, so that seems like it would work too, right? And that would accomplish this goal. So let's try doing this then. So let's say, let's define them as a node fast is head and node slow is head. And then let's just say while fast.next.next .next is not null, fast, fast equals fast.next.next .next, and then slow is equal to slow.next and then return slow. Is this going to do what we want it to? Are there any places in which this might fail? Yeah, cool. Yeah, so it would be it would fail if it were shorter than one element. Sure. Um, I think that's a great thing that you should consider. Like edge cases, like what if the list is only one element long? But I think I saw another hand on this side. That's what I was going to say. Yeah. Um. So. What about the case where um, fast.next is actually null? Is that possible? It seems like it would happen with um, every even numbered list, actually, right? Or every, you know, with every even, even length list. So let's add another check to this, right? Instead of while fast.next.next is not null, let's say while fast.next is not null and fast.next.next is not null. Would that work? So say that I have this list over here, right, where I have a length of three. Let's just see exactly what it actually, let's just see what it returns. So if we were to do a system out print line uh, middle of a dot data or dot val, I think that's what we call it, yeah, then Let's see. Hopefully we'll return with one, but let's see what happens there. Yeah, okay, so it does It does actually return with one. I was thinking that there could be a case where um, if, where you want to make sure that, like, where you make sure inside of it that, like, fast.next.next .next is, um, where you would never end up with a case where you could have advanced fast one more time, but you didn't because fast.next.next was null, but fast.next wasn't null. But this all depends on what we actually want to do when we define the problem, right? So what if we have an even length length list? Do we want to round down or do we want to round up? So right now with our current implementation, do we think that we round down or do we think that we round up? If we were to add a node D. What do we think? Yeah. Uh, we would round down because this thing would short circuit at the fast on next is not null before you would be able to go on. I think you're right with that. So let's see this. 
And indeed, it does round down. So if the interviewer wanted us instead to round up, then we would have to do a separate implementation where we instead um, didn't go, where we instead short-circuited before that. But this seems pretty fair. Um, so that is a way that you would return the middle node of a linked list with only one, um, with only one pass of the list. So I think it's really important to note that um, this is a really common trick that you see in a lot of linked list problems, having like a fast traverser and then having a slower traverser. So I personally think that a lot of linked lists in general is what I would just call tricks, right? Like there's things that you wouldn't normally think of by yourself and that I don't think anybody would honestly be expected to think of in like a really short period of time. However, I do think that because like everyone studies interview problems these days, you kind of have to know these tricks, which is a bit unfortunate, but that's just the way that it is. And this is just one of the tricks that you sort of have to learn. So the second one is reversing a singly linked list. How might you reverse the list with O of 1 space complexity? So, in, so if I were to give you this linked list right here, 1, 2, 3, and 4, I want you to return 3, 2, 1, 0. How do you think that might be done? Let's just start brainstorming ideas, right? So a recursive way to do it might be to take the first element of the list and just say, OK, I'm going to place this first element of the list into like this recursive helper function that will basically say, I'm going to reverse the rest of this list out over here and then put it over here, and then put the first element of the list in front of that reversed section. Um, so that seems like it would work, right? But remember, recursive functions don't actually ever have O of 1 space complexity. You always have to include stack space. This is an O of n algorithm. Let's think of ways that we might be able to do it iteratively. This diagram over here might help. So let's consider just a three element length list, right? Let's see what happens if we were to sort of like only take a look at whatever is inside of those brackets. What you want to do basically, right, is you want to be able to say, I want this arrow to be reversed to point in this direction instead. And then I want to like move the bracket over. And I want to keep doing that until I run to the end of the list. So that seems easy enough, right? Conceptually, this is exactly what we want to happen. There, you have a linked list as long as you can move those brackets. You have a reverse linked list as long as you can move those brackets over and just reverse the direction of the node every single time. So brackets don't exist in computer science outside of in source code, right? How can we do this with perhaps pointers? <coughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, you need to make sure to keep track of the next one afterwards, right? But it looks like even when we're on the first node, it seems like we have to like keep track of the one before it as well, right? Or otherwise, like you wouldn't be able to know what to sort of reverse your thing behind towards. So I think that's really good, right? So you need to keep track of like a next one and you need to keep track of a previous one. So if we were to rename these brackets to be like a series of pointers, then it would look something like Prev current temp, right? Where you'd have this set of three over here, you'd reverse it so that cur.next is equal to prev. And then you'd say, all right, I'm going to move everything up by one. And then you say cur.next is equal to prev, and then move everything up by one. That seems to work, right? So conceptually, it seems really simple, but in order to get this actually working in code, it's not that easy. So I'm going to try to code up a version, and y'all should point out anything that's wrong that you notice as I'm coding it out. OK, so um, let's do this. Public static node reverse, because we want to be able to still return the head of the new linked list. Otherwise, after we've reversed everything, we have no idea where anything is, and that was all useless anyway. So. Let's just say, let's do that. So we knew from before that we needed a, a prev, a cur, and a temp, right? So let's go over here and say <laughs> node prev is null at first, node cur is head, and node uh, temp is equal to head.next. So 
Yeah. Do we need to handle the edge case where the list is empty or like? Yeah, sure. So I think that like handling edge cases is something that's really useful. Um, in a lot of cases, you'll want to get into a habit of like, for example, even in the middle one, just being like, yo, if head is equal to null, then like just return immediately. Um, so that is pretty useful because we would run into a null pointer exception if the head were empty because we already have temp is equal to head dot next. But let's see if we can restructure our code in a way that doesn't even require that in the first place. So for example, Instead of doing temp equals head on next over here, why not say while cur is not null, node temp is head dot next or equals cur dot next in here, right? That way we never have to check for nullness. So over here, let's take a look at what we're doing exactly again. So we want to be able to keep track of temp. We already did that. We want to be able to say like we want cur dot next to be equal to prev. And then we want to be able to advance everything, right? So temp is being re-declared every single time. So we don't need to worry about advancing temp explicitly. But we do need to advance prev and we do need to advance cur. So what does that look like? That looks like prev being advanced to cur and then cur being advanced to next or temp, as we call it over here, right? So after all of this, we have our stuff, but at what point do we finally exit, right? We finally exit when cur suddenly hits null, and that's exactly what we want over here. But we still want to be able to return the head, right? Well, cur's now null. Do we just lose track of the head? No, because with the way that we wrote our code, prev is now pointing to the new head. So after all of this, you should return prev. So let's see if this works, right? So after we have all of this, let's do system out print line. Uh, or actually, we should do print list of reverse of a. And let's see if we have what we expect. Yeah, that seems to be right, right? Over here, we have exactly a reversed linked list. So again, um, like Elizabeth said, it's always really good to check for like edge cases. With the way that we wrote ours, you never have to check for edge cases. This will work on every single list. Let's take a look at our middle thing though. Will this ever run into edge cases where it might be, you know, it might fail? Yeah. If head equals null, then yeah, if head equals null, that's the only one, right? So if head is null, then fast doesn't have a next value, and that would fail. So let's say if head is null, return head. And that takes care of it. All right, cool. So we've gotten through two problems already in a record amount of time. Um, what have we learned from that, right? So the first one is using extra variables. Uh, in both of our problems, we sort of had to use extra variables that we didn't lose track of what we already had. And we also noted how bad it was in a lot of cases to use recursion. Some problems do lend themselves more easily to recursive, um, to recursive solutions, but in general, because you do save space by like writing it iteratively, and because like you just end up most of the time having fewer bugs in writing iteratively, even when you think that you can write a shorter, quote unquote, like more concise solution recursively, you should still consider it iteratively as like possibly the best approach. So all right, now let's up the difficulty a little bit. I'm going to give you two linked lists now, and I want you to know their intersection. So what does that mean? That means I'm going to give you a linked list one and a linked list two, and I want you to give me this node, the first node at which they intersect at. What are some ways that you might be able to do that? Don't think about space complexity. Don't think about time complexity. What, what's a really simple way? Yeah. Yeah, right? So like you, you take every single node from one of your linked lists and compare it to like every single node from another one of your linked lists. Um, and if you do it in order, then eventually you should get to the first node at which they ever intersect, right? So 
You know what I really like about that solution? It doesn't require any extra space. Even though its time complexity is kind of bad, there's O of 1 extra space complexity because all you're doing is you're just traversing every time. Yeah? Um, I should have a question about like, the problem itself. So, yeah. Like, they, they intersect in the sense that they have the like, necessary node on the same value, or that they're pointing to the same node? That they're pointing to the same node. Yeah. That's really important to clarify, actually, um, because I know that. Uh, wait, have you all turned in CompSci 250 yet? Okay, never mind. I can't talk about it. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. What do we think? Yeah. So in Java, you can create a set and just throw every address you see um, into it, and then it it does it, or I don't know the set like. If it's already in there, then you know that that's the particular one that you uh -huh. look in the other list. So yeah. You traverse them one like one whole thing with the other, or one by one, whatever. Mm -hmm. Cool. So what's the time complexity of that then? N plus m, where n and m are the size of the two. Okay. Cool. So we just reduced it from like a m times n time complexity to an n plus m time complexity. But did we have a trade-off with that? What was the trade-off? So now you have a potential set or list of size also n plus n. Yeah, yeah. So that's not that's not perfect, right? Um, I think that we can still do better than that. Um, in a lot of linked lists, what you'll find is that like you can solve the problem basically, like not always, but in I'd say like a good portion of linked lists, problems you can solve the problem essentially entirely with pointers. Yeah. Yeah, I think that might work actually. So, um, what's your name? Uh, Eddie. Eddie. Yeah, so Eddie came up with this idea where he was saying, wait, okay, so we know they intersect at some place, right? And you know that these two lists have certain lengths. So if we were to start them at the, if we were to like advance the head of the longer node until it was as far from the from the tail, or advance the head from the longer node until it was as far to the tail as the head of the shorter node, and then we just advance them at the same rate, then they would intersect at some point, right? It would look a little bit like that. That's pretty nifty. I, I think that's the right idea. So let's see if we can code that. And wait, that's great. We already have a length method. Isn't that super convenient? So let's do this. All right, so public static node or intersect of node L1 and node L2, right? So, so int length 1 is the length of L1, and int length 2 is equal to the length of L2. Did I misspell, how do I spell length? L-E-N-G-T-H, okay, cool. All right, so now we have these two lengths, right? So then we say, um, okay, we're going to have to take the longer length, and we're going to have to advance the head of the node that many forward. So, um, let's take the difference and then say if length 1 is greater than length 2, then um, for an i0, i is less than forward, i increasing, then we do length, uh, hold on, then we do, um, okay, so let's not mutate our inputs, so let's define traversers, right? So let's say node cur1 is equal to l1, and then node cur2 is equal to l2. So let's say that for, for that, then we're going to be doing cur1 is equal to cur1 dot next, else do the exact same thing for the opposite one. Wow, I'm in the middle of here and I realize, wait, I'm writing the same for loop inside both of them except it's only slightly different. So what can I do instead? Well, 
This is an important skill for you to learn during, re uh, during interviewing, which is learning how to refactor your code on the fly. Um, I think it's something that a lot of interviewers think is really just impressive um, in general. So uh, I don't know if you all are familiar um, with ternary expressions. Um, I'm actually not going to use one here. I think it makes the code more confusing. Let's just move this thing in there. So it blank else cur2 is equal to cur2 next. Right? And then after all of this, let's say while cur1 is not equal to cur2, cur1 is cur1.next. cur2 is cur2.next. At the end of all of that, return cur1. And you should have that. So how might we test this? We already have a really nice linked list over here, which I'm going to not reverse. Um, so now we have just like 0, 1, 2, 3. Let's define something like 4 and 5 that event, like, um, like 4, 5, 6 that eventually leads to 2. So let's do this. F, G, and then we have 4, 5, and 6. So then we say e.next is F, f.next is G, and then g.next is, we want it to point to 2 eventually, so we want to say C, right? So at this point, the intersection of the two nodes would be at 2. Um, and we can prove that by saying, okay, let's print list of um, E, right? So if we were to print list E, then what we should see is something that says 4, 5, 6, 2, 3. So let's just make sure that we've set up our linked list correctly first. Hey, what's up? So this is the Catalyst interview prep course. So I'm dumb. Probably. <laughs> You're welcome to join, though. I've heard great stuff about it. Yeah? Um, uh, good luck. I'm s I guess I got the wrong word. <laughs> no, you're good, dude. Take care. All right. <laughs> um, all right, cool. So we did get the right answer here, right? So we have a 4, 5, 6, 2, 3 over here. Now let's try to get the intersection of A intersect of A and E and get the value of that. Hopefully we should get 2. And that's exactly what we got, 2 right there. So I said before that there's like a lot of tricks involved with like singly linked lists. Like, yeah, this is just one of the many examples. Uh -huh. I was just going to say, another way you could do it that has less time but more space is go through one of them and just use the reverse method and reverse all of them, but keep track of everything you've seen, then start on the other one and go until you see something in that other way. So you're saying to go along, like, for example, this lower branch. Yeah, and reverse all of them. And reverse it as you go along, so. Yeah, but and also reverse. keep track of all the elements you see. Okay. And then start on the other list. Yeah. And then go, so if you went on the other list, uh -huh. the top one, and you got to L1 and L2, yeah. then that would point you back onto the bottom branch, which uh -huh. you recorded. Yeah, so I think that is a decent idea. Um, I think that that's basically what Brian said, except without, with an additional reverse step. Um, so, yeah. Um, at the end of the day, I do think that, like, you should be going for, like, the lowest complexity solution in all cases, that caveat that you're comfortable with coding because if you're not comfortable with coding up a solution that you mentioned then in some cases it might be worse than for you to simply just be like okay you know what I'm just gonna go for like the n squared solution but at least I know how to do that okay so um let's do another one so this one requires a bit more thinking um this is detecting whether there is a loop in a singly linked list so what does a loop look like um, so let's say that we have this here, right? We want to return the node of the first intersection, and we're given the head. So we want to be able to go through at some point 
and be like, oh wait, we've already seen this node before. Um, is there any way for you to do that? Yeah. Similar to what Diane said before, we use a fast pointer and a slow pointer, and then when they equal the same thing, you know, you've gotten to the, the thing that it beats. Yeah, sure. So can you explain for a bit how that might work? Yeah, so you have one pointer that, they both start at the head, uh -huh. and one moves two, while, uh -huh. while the other one moves one. Yeah. And once they keep going around, at some point, if there's a circle, they should equal each other. And if that's true, then you know there's a circle. But if one gets to null, then you know that's straight. Okay, yeah, so um, that seems like it should intuitively work, right? Because if you keep going forward with the fast pointer and there is some sort of loop, then the fast and the slow get trapped in here forever, and you think that they would meet at some point, right? So like I said before, we're not going to prove anything in this class, but this does indeed work. If we have a fast and a slow pointer, then we can go forth, and eventually they will meet. So that's cool. We found a cycle. We found that a loop does indeed exist. But how can we get that first intersection node right there? If we were to do this naively, it would be pretty simple, right? You just throw all of them in a hash set until you like hit the one that you saw before and then you just like return that element. But I think it's my hand up over here. Oh yeah, if you're doing what she said, you have the fast and slow pointer. Um, if you want to return the element that uh, is shared, um, uh -huh. when they are equal to each other, you can just return that. When, a, or when pointer A is equal to B, you can return A over B. Yeah, sure. So the problem with that is A equals B over here. That is a node in a cycle, but you want to know like when the beginning of that cycle was. And I know that cycles don't technically have a beginning or an end, but I'm talking about the node that has two things pointing to it, not just one. Yeah? Would you keep a pointer at the beginning node, and then uh, I guess you also probably have a pointer after the slow one, and then you said the pointer was after the slow one. Um, so you're saying after all of this, you have a pointer of where? Uh, so then there would be a pointer behind the slow. Behind the slow? Yeah, and then you would set that next to null. Okay, and so you then, can break this connection. Yeah, and then so now you have the slow one, and then you also have a pointer at the beginning. Uh-huh. And then you find the intersection with the, the method that you have to Oh, okay, I see. Yeah, sure, so that... Seems to work, right? Yeah. What do you think? What do you mean the middle? Like you, you have like the middle function, right? Yeah. If you find that middle node, so <coughs> that node, you should be able to achieve the same thing. So, what are you saying? Like advance this at the same rate as you advance the head? Like if you if you see Here, feel free to come up here and like point to stuff because this is all very graphical. I'm not quite sure what you're talking about with this split. So, so we got that function called middle, right? Uh -huh. Where you can find the middle of them. This, I mean, I just yeah. worked for this example, but there's yeah. one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So it should start here, right? Uh huh. So if you have this and this, if you traverse them at the same time. Shit, never mind. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> no, you're good, you're good. Yeah, this okay. is confusing. Like, I I honestly don't think that this is a great interview question because you sort of need some sort of, like, pre-knowledge or else you're just sort of dead in the water. Yeah? I can think of, like, two ways to do this. One which requires extra time and one which requires extra space. Okay. So, like, the time one is basically, yeah, you keep a pointer at the head and then you let the other two race off to see if there's a loop. Okay. If yeah. there is then you kind of have the one, the slow one, I guess, traverse uh -huh. until it reaches the fast one again. And if at any point that's equal to the head pointer, then that's where they meet up. Like, you're already at the intersection. If not, then you can traverse head by one and then do the same thing. Cycle slow once and see if it... Ends. Oh, okay, I see. So you're yeah. saying you're already in the cycle. So you can go around the cycle once move it forward, go around the cycle once, yeah. move it forward, until you eventually hit it. So okay. no one prior to those space. Okay. 
But if you wanted to do it with space, that way, then once you find the cycle, uh -huh. um, you can just put everything in the cycle on the in a, a list, which is better than putting every single node in the list because maybe uh -huh. the, like loop is at the very end. Okay. But it still could be the entire thing anyway. Okay. Um, and then you just basically increment until you find something in the list. Okay. So yeah, both of those are very both of those are good options. Um, both of them will solve the problem. Um, which honestly, in an interview with a harder question, sometimes all you do is to be able to solve the problem and state why your problem isn't as good as it could be, and then say if you were given more time, like how you might think about it in the future. But you don't need to necessarily get towards like a perfectly working solution in that forty-five minutes or one hour or whatever. I want you to notice something though. Could it be just a coincidence? that the intersection is just as many far away, or that the intersection of fast and slow is just as many far away from the first intersection node as it is from the head. How many of y'all have taken 230 and have gotten to the part about modular arithmetic? Yeah, sure. So it's like clock arithmetic, right? So if like two hours past, you know, eleven p.m. is going to be one a.m. Um, and it just like keeps on repeating in a cycle, in a cycle, in a cycle. Let's start labeling some of these parts of the cycle, right? So let's give these names. The first loop node I'm going to call it is node F. I'm not writing your application. Um. And the first intersection node we're going to call i. So the distance from the head to f is 2 in this example. And the distance from f to i is 5 in this example, right? And then whatever is remaining, OK, so the slow node always moves df plus di nodes from the head. And your fast node moves twice as far, just by definition, right? Because it's always going dot next, dot next. But if you'll notice, the fast node and the slow node end up in the same place. So that means that 2 times df plus di is equal to df plus di nodes from i, which is just equal to 0 nodes from i. You end up in the same place, right? So we're given this, right? This means that moving forward, this df plus di nodes from i gets you right back here. You see that? If you only move forward df nodes, then it should get you right back to f. Because you know that this part is all di. That's why you can advance the pointer at the exact same rate from here and from here, and you'll get to the exact same intersection node. There's also another way to think about it um, in terms of you know, just defining one additional variable, where x is the remaining distance in your loop between i and f. So again, like before, slow has moved df plus di nodes. And then afterwards, you know that fast has moved again, as before, 2 times df plus di nodes from the head, which is also equal to df plus di plus x plus df, right? Solving for that, you get that df over here is exactly the same as x which is the exact same result as before. So at the very end of it, all you need to do is just to be able to go straight, is to be able to find the loop using the method that we discussed before of having the fast and the slow pointers, and then afterwards, moving them forward at exactly the same rate. I'm actually not going to post solution code for this right now because it actually takes too long for me just to set up a linked list with that many nodes. It's not super easy to add that. but. Um, I will be posting solutions with the full code after class, and you can sort of play around with that. So some more stuff to think about. Can you detect the length of this cycle? Another thing to think about, like what if the fast pointer goes three nodes at a time, or four, or five? What if the slow node, does the slow node just have to be slower than the fast node? Can you use nodes of any two length, like speeds which are not equal? These are questions that you will maybe ponder in 2.30. I don't know how hard he's making it this semester. OK, cool. So second set of interviewing tactics, right? The first one is draw a diagram. I highly doubt that like you would have had as much success solving this without drawing that stuff out as you would have like you know, actually putting note, like pen to paper and drawing out those notes. 
The second thing is to play to your advantages, right? So for some of y'all, you might have a more like graphical mind, and you might be able to see like this as like, oh, this is like a part of a cycle, versus other people who might be able to see it as like, oh, this is like D notes or whatnot. Just know what your advantages are. Um, it helps to just like honestly do more practices, and you'll be able to come up with like a lot more personally effective solutions in the middle of um in the middle of an interview setting. So let's give you. I think this is the last problem before we hit a break. Um, yeah, so this is adding two numbers. So say that I give you like two numbers which are represented as singly length lists. I want you to give the sum of those two numbers. How might you do that? Any, any ideas? Yeah. Yeah, um, that sounds great. Can you discuss why, like, the motivation behind, like, maybe, like, reversing it or, like, having an overflow node, something like that? Well, intuitively, like, when you're doing, like, math and you're just doing 927 over 235, you move from the one digit to the hundred digit. Uh -huh. So I was just kind of, like, mirroring that logic mm -hmm. and, like, how you actually set up the, uh, the linked list. Yeah. Question? Did you also have to keep track of, like, where you are in the list? Could the overflow ever be more than nine? So like think about what the largest possible value of it like. So if you add like the two largest like ones digit, you'll get like an eight or you'll get a one as your overflow. Wait, were you saying to add the overflow to the next value before you did it? Yeah, so if you add seven and five, yeah, you get two. Yeah. Four. Yeah, I think we was talking about a per digit overflow yeah, rather than like a total overflow. Oh, yeah. Because otherwise you have to create an entirely new like linked right, yeah. list like to yeah. So this is really cool because you can actually add numbers that are like gigantic um in this case. Like you could have as many digits as fit in your computer memory and you'd be able to like still add them. Um which I know that we talked about the limitations of like Java integers and stuff in a previous class. Um there's a lot of ways to get around them, and one of them is to like just store different parts and numbers in like different parts of arrays with like the more significant digits becoming like earlier on in the array. So I always thought that was pretty cool. So given that we already have a reverse function, this seems like it should be like decently straightforward, right? Let's try to do this. So um, let's write a public static node add of node n1 and node n2. So those are just the two numbers, right? So the first thing that we want to do is um, we want to be able to reverse it. But we don't want to do it in a way that like destroys the numbers themselves. So remember that our reversing function is it mutates the input. It doesn't create a new list. It just reverses the existing list. So it's really important to remember to unreverse the list at the very end of the operation. So just in case, let's just do that right now. So, um, so um, and then we have a bunch of stuff, and then eventually, after all of that, we want to do n1 is reverse. We want to copy that again, right? We want to be able to make sure that we didn't change anything that didn't belong to us. So let's think about how we might be able to represent what the sums of our digits are. I think that in a lot of cases, it helps to have a dummy head. That is, so that way we don't have to write like a if head is equal to null case. Instead, we can just return like dummy head dot next. So let's do that. So node dummy head, we can just call it a dummy, is a new node. And we're just going to give it a random value. It could be anything. Eventually, we're going to return 
Okay. Eventually, we're going to reverse. So we're going to do dummy is equal to reverse. Right. Okay. Yeah. Is equal to reverse dummy. And we're going. Wow. Well, and we're going to return dummy dot next. So now we're going to do all the heavy lifting of actually going through. Right. So. What we want to say is we want to say, okay, let's um let's take a look at what the shorter value is. And let's just add on, like, because once you're done adding on like all the shorter values, like you can basically do whatever you want with like the larger values. So let's just say while n okay, so let's do node c1 is n1 and node c2 is n2. So that way we can keep going forward. So and then we're going to be calling uh, node ret for return. It's eventually it's going to be the same. Let's call it c3 is equal to dummy. So while c1 is not null and c2 is not null, we want to look at the sum, right? So int sum is c1 dot val uh, plus c2 dot val. And we also want to eventually never forget to advance them. So c1.next, c1 is equal to c1.next, and c2 is equal to c2.next. Right. So what do we do with this sum? Hmm? So we can say um, that we can define an overflow, just like um, Jared suggested, outside of our loop, because we want the overflow to be persistent even throughout. And we're going to say that the overflow is 0 at first. right? So our overflow, what is our overflow in this case? Our overflow is just the remainder. And because of the way that division works in uh, Java, you always round the remainder down, or you always take away the remainder. So like you just get the quotient. And that's perfect. Our overflow is equal to sum divided by 10. right? So at this point, um, we say, Um, plus overflow from the previous one. So the sum is equal to the current val from both of them plus the overflow from whatever came in a less significant digit. And then we say, okay, so node next is equal to a new node that has a value of sum, right? And we're going to say c three dot next is equal to next, and we're going to say c three is equal to next. What's that doing? It's basically saying, okay, well, I want to add on this new node to the front of it, and I'm going to now advance my pointer at the end of this list, so that way I can continue adding an O of one time at the end of the list. So this seems pretty good, right? This seems like we have done everything that we needed to in terms of, you know, adding to the numbers. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great point, right? So such as question was, wait, so C1 plus val plus C2 plus val plus overflow could be anything up to 19. Like it could be huge, right? So what what are we doing? Um I think that is a great point and that we should do sum minus 10 over here. That makes sense, right? The overflow is equal to whatever we have in the tens digit, and that is equal to whatever we have in the ones digit. Or and the actual sum that we have inside the linked list is whatever we have in the ones digit. So we keep going through all of that and we say, okay, awesome. I think it is perfectly valid if you're unsure in the quality of your code to like test it as you go through. So I might actually be testing it right now. Huh? Um, well, if sum is less than 10, then node becomes a negative value. So wouldn't that have to be mod 10 and not minus 10? Yeah, perfect. So if you take a look at the example that I gave, hold on. It was 235 and 927, right? So Let's just try to add those two together. So 2, 3, 5, and 9, 2, 7. 
So we're not going to say that c dot x is equal to d. We are going to say that uh, d dot next is e. Yeah, next is f. Okay, cool. So then um, we should print what we have in terms of a and d. And we're going to print out the add result of this. Well, OK, now things are starting to make a bit more sense. We've added the last one, but we forgot to add the last overflow. In addition to forgetting the last overflow, can we think of what might happen if we were to have two linked lists of different lengths? I think that we should try to go along one of the two branches, right? To see like which whichever one's longer, we should just continue adding on stuff until like we eventually run out of stuff to add. So we can say while c1 is not null, do something, and then while c2 is not null, do something, right? And these two are going to be exactly the same, except that we're going to just switch the values of c1 and c2 in these respectively. Because at this point, only one of them remains. So you don't have to worry about adding on anything, you just have to worry about adding on overflow. So a lot of this logic is going to be the exact same. Let's just copy this over. So in sum is equal to just c1 val plus overflow. All this overflow logic is still pretty much the same except we're just going to copy this on over, right? Same thing with over here. We're going to copy the exact same thing over. Um, I'm going to make this c2 is not null. Change this to c2, change this to c2, c2 dot next. And then at the very end of all of that, we have one more thing. We have to check for overflow one more time just to see if we have anything at the end. So int, so if, overflow is 1, then c3.next is equal to a new node of the value of 1. And then after that, you say, you don't have to say anything because you're just going to reverse it afterwards. So after all of this, after all this is done, let's see if we've gotten the correct answer. 1162. Okay, cool. So, what did we learn from this? We learned a lot of things, right? So, the first thing is make sure that our code works correctly in all areas, including the header tail. Um, that's why we used a dummy head, right? So that we didn't have to do like this, like if head is null thing. Um, also, make sure that you preserve the input. It seems kind of simple in like most cases, like use a traverser, but when you're doing things like reversing a linked list in place in order to like do something to it, it's really easy to forget to accident like accidentally forget to reverse it back. Because what you do at the very end is you say, okay, wait, I'm gonna print the list and it, it's exactly the answer that we want and we're done, right? But you need to make sure that like you actually do end up re-reversing it or unmutating the inputs if eventually you do have to like do something with that. Um, the last thing is helper functions. We were lucky enough that we wrote a bunch of helpful helper functions throughout the course of this lesson, like reverse and like length and all of that stuff. Um, it helps modularize your code, it helps keep it clean, it's generally just super useful. So you're going to expect to see a lot more helper functions, especially when we go into trees and graphs, when the data structures get a bit more complex, and a lot of like trees and graphs is basically like setting up the problem itself. All right, cool. So, um, welcome back, everyone. Uh, we're going to get into stacks now. So, stacks are a pretty fundamental data structure, um, and there's basically two things that define stacks. So, the first thing is that like they're first in, first out, right? So, just like a stack of whatever, the last thing that you put on top is the first thing that you're going to grab when you reach in again. So, this is super useful for tasks where you have to keep a reverse order of elements on hand. Whenever you think of something as like, oh, I need to reverse something, whenever you have a problem where you need to reverse something, you should probably think like, oh, I want to like put it to a stack. Um, in addition to that, stacks have only two basic methods. They're just push and pop. And those corresponds to putting something on the stack and taking stuff off of the stack. It's important to note that like stacks are something which can be implemented in a lot of ways. 
So whatever your implementation of stack is, unless push and pop are O of one time, it's not really a stack. Um, it's really important that these are constant time because they're the only operations that you really do with a stack. Um, that is fundamental to it. You can add stuff like, you know, like size or like is empty, like peaking at the top element instead of necessarily like removing it. But without these two elements, without these two um, functions, you can't have a stack. So like I said before, stacks are abstract, right? So you can think of them as like Java interfaces or abstract classes. There are many, many ways for you to have a stack. So they are not a concrete data structure the way that like an array is. So I think that's really important to note that singly linked lists, arrays, and stacks are all related in some pretty fundamental ways. And I hope they all can see this by trying to implement a stack using a singly linked list. So these slides are a bit older. I actually <coughs> did this at a point when we weren't even going to like show code in class. So this is going to be a lot more graphical. Imagine that you had um, like, you know, two identical stacks. You initialize it with like a dummy head, and you initialize it with having a head pointer at negative one if you were to have an array implementation. Then imagine that you pop something to it. You'd initialize a new node, and you'd say, OK, this new node is going to be my new head, and I'm going to make this node point to the dummy head. Alternatively, you would increment the head pointer over here and say, OK, whatever is at the head pointer is going to be the top element of my stack. Let's add a couple more elements, right? Let's push four, and let's push three. At every single point, we're saying, OK, so let's go back to when we had seven, right? Um, so over here, we said the previous head was four. And we said, we're going to make a new node. And that's going to be seven. Then we're going to say seven dot next is equal to the old head. And then we're going to say head is equal to seven. So this way, you can always keep track of the head of this stack. Over here, alternatively with an array, you simply increment the head pointer, say, OK, whatever's in the array at this position is a new top element of my stack. So things seem fine, right? But this seems a bit counterintuitive, doesn't it? Like linked lists, you normally add stuff going forward instead of like you know pushing stuff behind the back of the linked list every single time. So why do we do it that way? Well, what happens when we want to remove something, right? When we pop, we can just say head is equal to head.next. And then we do something like, we might want to do something with the value. You probably do because you want to like, you know, store something. You probably say int val is equal to like head.val and then head equals head.next return val. And if you added stuff going forward instead, then you have to go all the way to the second to last item of a list, which is an O of n operation, and then chop it off there. So that's why we would add at the back of a list when it comes to a linked list with the stack. Um, and with the array implementation, it's a lot easier. Uh, you literally just decrease the stack pointer. You return whatever was at the previous stack pointer location. So it's important to note that you don't need to reset values to 0 in the array. Because when you implement a stack, in most cases, like in order to like save time and also just because it's not necessary, you can just say whatever's beyond the end of the head pointer is just garbage values. Like I don't care about you don't have to reset them to zero. Zero could be a valid value. Any the general rule of thumb is anything above the head pointer in memory for an array implementation is going to be not valid. Um, same thing uh, is that a, a similar note is like dealing with the quote unquote garbage values in a linked list implementation, right? So in memory managed languages like Java and Python, where you don't have to deal with like you know allocating memory yourself, um, then once you dereference these by like you know saying head equals head on next and it's no longer needed by any other object, garbage collection automatically comes through and just like removes those from memory. Um, you would have to remember to like do some other stuff if you were doing something in C or C++. But for the purposes of this class, you don't really need to worry too much about like the extra memory. This is just a caveat if you might be confused a little bit about like wait why are there still numbers like above the head pointer. So after that, let's try just to pop another one. I think what's important to note between these is that once you add another one, like whatever was before is like entirely cleared out. Like you just don't know what happened before in the linked list implementation. So um, this, as always, is going to be posted later on, um, and you can just think of this as like you know 
your your like quick guide as to how singly linked lists and arrays and stacks are all related. On a similar note, um, how might you be able to manage two stacks with a single array? Any ideas? Hmm? Are they completely like distinct stacks? Yeah, completely Not distinct. Sure, but what if one stack's way bigger than the other? You still have a bit of wasted space, right? So, how many of y'all have taken 250? Yeah, um, do you remember how memory in the heap grows? Memory in the heap grows from top down. Memory in the stack grows from bottom up. You can manage two stacks in the same space by simply having one stack grow up from the bottom and the other stack grow down from the top. And you can store as many elements as your array is long at that point. And those two stacks can be of completely different sizes but you could still theoretically completely efficiently utilize that array. So I think that this is like a possible conceptual question that they might ask you. So this is somewhat worth remembering that you can implement two stacks within one memory space. So now that we know what stacks are, let's try doing something with stacks, right? So when we were semicolon hunting back there, slash like maybe looking for brackets or whatever, we were like, damn, it really sucks to like, you know, have to resolve compile errors. And in a lot of cases, like mismatch brackets or parentheses are the cause of it. So say that I give you an ASCII string that contains a bunch of characters which are open and closed parentheses, open and closed brackets, and open and closed curly braces. You need to make sure that these are like a valid order for them to be in. That means that every single open of whatever is matched by a close of whatever at some point. This also means that you can't close something before you open it. And finally, um, uh, this is probably really confusing because it's mirrored for y'all. You can't close something without having first opening it, right? And the final thing is, um, if you had like an example like over, um, over uh, here, right? where you tried to close this parentheses while this bracket was still open, that's not valid either. So how might you go about doing this? Yeah? You could go through the list, and then you see something. You could be adding it to a stack, and then if the next, if you see the same thing, if you, so if you go to the next element, and it's the same as the previous thing on the stack, and you pop it, like pop that one off the stack. Something like that. Yeah, sure, but you would need, I'm assuming you mean like some sort of mapping, right? So like, you know, you would map an open to a closed, and like so on and so forth. Okay, yeah, that seems pretty valid. Um, so you would only do this for characters that are within like your, um, your valid set though. Right. Um, so that, that seems like a pretty good idea, though. Uh, let's go forth and try to solve it this way. So let's say, let's take our look at is balanced, right? So we'd have a stack of characters. And let's import all of that. Um, and then let's come up with our mapping, right? So we'd say and after that, um, or sorry, map this new hash map. And then um, we'd say, okay, so let's stick this in, right? Stick in that and that. And let's note that in our problem description, um, we could have a bunch of characters that aren't either opening or closing braces. 
So let's make sure that we're only taking a look at characters which are actually valid. So, um, uh, let's see. We should actually put these in reverse order, I think, because eventually what I think Dave's idea was, was we would go through and we would take a look for the closing bracket and see if the corresponding opening bracket is indeed the same. So let's do this. OK. So now let's have a set of valid characters. So set of character. And we're just going to do Add all the values and all of the keys. Okay, so cool. Now that we have this, let's go through the array. So, or through the strings. So for zero, it's less than strings length. And what do we say here, right? So the first thing that we need to do is check to see if the string is even valid. So we'd say, okay, so if set.contains C, then what do we do? Um, then we'd want to say, oh, okay, is it a value or is it a key? So then we'd say if set.contains C, or sorry, if map dot contains key C, it's either key or a value. So if it contains a key, then we'd say if. So let's do the else statement first. I think it's a bit easier. So if the map, if it's not a key, then it's a value, which means that it's an opening bracket. So that means that we do stack dot push C, right? Here we'd say if map contains if it contains a key of C. Then we'd say if c is not equal to map.get c, then return false. Eventually, if you go through all of this, then you should return true. Right? So let's just try to see if this would actually work. So let's get a main method going. So what are some examples, right? So catalyst should work. And we want to print out uh, is balance test. So let's compile that and see if we get what we want. So over here, I just hit tab by accident. It's an s.carat. So hopefully this compiles now. And I compiled another problem instead. So <laughs> we're going to run this one instead. We're going to run stack problem. And it returned false. Interesting, right? So over here, um, the only way for you to return false is for this to be unbalanced. And so we said if the map contains key, so if the map contains a key of C, then that. Let's let's see if it's an issue of like a care versus a character equality sort of thing. Yeah. Statement that says if it's not equal to map.get c, yeah, do we do not have to say if it is equal then pop the corresponding opening bracket off to top of the Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we go through and we say, okay, so here's one of the issues, right? So our character was an opening bracket and uh. If, okay, so it did contain a key, so of C, so, um, 
we okay so it was so that was a closing bracket and we said okay cool so then map.getc is the corresponding opening bracket so if c is not equal to okay um hold on so we have a closing bracket and if c is not equal if stack.pop is not equal to map.getc then return false because you want to be comparing yeah okay so that should work okay so yeah that works as intended right you want to get the top item off the stack instead of comparing whatever you had in the map to itself that doesn't really make sense so let's um let's test with some more values so for string s and test we'll print out this right so now we have a new string array that we can use uh, to sort of test out different values so we have catalyst we have that let's just copy it over what we can um, Oh, that's annoying. They um they changed all the brackets into fake brackets or all the quote marks into like fake quote marks. Okay. So with this we should get three trues and two falses. And that's exactly what we expected to get. Except that I messed up a little bit. At the very last line, think about what would happen if you put in just a string that was just one opening parentheses. As of right now, even though that technically isn't balanced, it would return true because it didn't, you know, hit any of the invalid conditions. This means that just as Elizabeth pointed out for the next problem, you need to make sure that the stack is empty at the end and that there aren't any opened brackets that haven't been closed. So we need to change that very last line from being returned true to being returned stack dot is empty. Awesome. So um, let's continue along then. So what if I simplify this problem? What if I only care about like one set of brackets? Does that, does that simplify the problem at all? Do we still need a stack necessarily? Remember what we said before, right? Stacks are really important when you need to keep a reverse order of elements on hand. This is because we have examples like <coughs> this last one over here, where you need the reverse order of these two in order to be able to determine whether or not it was actually valid. You couldn't simply keep a count of the number of parentheses and brackets and curly braces. But what if we just made it such that there were only one type of thing that we needed to keep track of being open or closed. Yeah? Could you keep track of two variables like open and close, and then each time you encounter an open, you increment it, each time you encounter a close, you increment it, and if closed ever exceeds open, then you know that it doesn't work? Yeah, sure. Um, so that seems pretty fair. Uh, yeah. Uh, this is all contained in a string, right? Yeah, this is all contained in a string. Yeah, so you would just find either the first index of one of those brackets, Yeah. Yeah. Such it? Sort of condense that a little bit by having just like one, even like a integer or something, and we iterate through and we decrement, decrement it if we encounter a close and we encounter an open but nothing like mm -hmm. that. And if it's zero, we know we have something wrong and then we find it. Yeah. Exactly.
Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense because, Elizabeth, you were basically just saying we should keep track of the difference between open and closed and make sure that's positive, right? Well, you can <coughs> simplify that literally just by having one number. So int uh, balance is 0 for, just go through the string. And you just say if C is an opening bracket, then increase the balance. Else if C because we still need to ignore all the characters, right? So if you see it, else if C is equal to closing bracket. Then you'd say, okay, well, if balance is okay, so if balance is less than zero, then return false. So at the end of all that, you would return true. And let's take a look at our examples again, right? So one, two, and three and 4 and 5 should all be balanced, technically. Let's um, just change this to that. So now we should get three, 4 trues and 1 false. So let's just try that. Yeah, that's exactly what we expected. So yeah. Does, this, does that handle if we have more opening brackets? Does that handle if we have more opening brackets? That's a great question. At the very end, what should you really be returning? You should be returning whether every single bracket has been closed, which would be balance is equal to zero. So go through all of this. Just to make sure that we have this, then uh, what you could say is you could have two opening brackets and only one closing bracket and see if it still returns false. And indeed, at the end, it still does return false. So yeah, you can simplify a lot of these problems um, just by making sure that you, um, you can simplify a lot of these problems because you might think that something requires an abstract data structure, but there are cases, an advanced data structure, but there are cases in which you can just simplify um, with, by noticing like a trick of like symmetry or something else in the problem. So I think this is the last problem that we'll have time to get to today. Um, it's designing a max stack. So your job is to basically try to implement a stack, uh, much like we saw implemented with a linked list or an array before that. Um, but you also have a get max function that gets the maximum element of the stack in constant time. So you need four functions. You need an is empty, a pop, a push, and a get max function. Um, the good thing about this is that you can use whatever data structures that already exist in order to implement this. So if you were to want to use an existing stack for whatever reason to implement this, then you are totally able to do so. Do you have any ideas for how that might work? Yeah. Can we just um, keep a normal stack and then just have a get max function that just has an integer that checks if the new value is greater than the integer? Greater than the current value, and then just return the max. From the yeah, sure. So what happens when you pop stuff? Oh, you need to update to get the maximum value. Hmm. You need to update the maximum value. Like if you pop the maximum value, you need to update and make it all get max greater. Yeah, sure. So how might that possibly work, right? So say that I pop like an increasing set of things um, and so I, I or say that I push an increasing set of things I push like one two three four um, then at every point in a cycle going up get max would be correct um, and then at every single point going down you could also th say okay well I might be correct but s because you'd say okay well four was the max now I'm gonna pop it so I'm guessing that whatever is below that 
would be the max. And in this case, you would guess correctly. But say that you popped like um, 1, 2, 10, 4. Or like, sorry, like 1, 2, like 1, 2, 5, 4, 10, right? So then in that case, you'd have 10 as the max. And then you'd look at what was below and you'd say, oh, wait, 4 is the max. And then in that case, it wouldn't necessarily be correct. Yeah. So what if you created two stats, like the one that the user is using, uh -huh. and then one for the maximum numbers? Yeah. So as you um, basically push new numbers on there, you check if it's a max, and then mm -hmm. you like put that in the max stack if it's a new one. Mm -hmm. And then if they need that max for some reason, you could peek at the top. And, and then if you remove an element and it's equal to that max, then you get rid of that. And what that does is basically um, whatever is under that was the, the max before you put the new one in, mm -hmm. which means that it's got to be the biggest one in the remaining area. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's fair. Any other ideas? I have like other instance variables. Uh, yeah, sure. What were you thinking of? I was thinking, um, why not like create some variable called max, and then like every time you push something in, you check to see greater than whatever their max is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure, but remember that the stack can still pop stuff. So like my example before, like 1, 2, 3, like 1, 2, 5, 4, 10. Like at every single point pushing, you'd be correct. But then you pop 10, what's the max now? Yeah. Um, I'm not sure. I, I think that what you're talking about is an idea that's pretty similar to what Brian said. Correct. Oh, oh, do, do you think it is? Or I'm not sure I'm interpreting what you're saying quite correctly. So you're saying... Like, if you want to keep on going down and checking mm -hmm. the different values, you need like, an array list or something on the outside that's yeah. going to track that. Yeah, yeah. So how um okay, wait, so you're saying keep a running total of the current possible max values in the array list? Well all you need to put in the array list is like if you have like one, two, like or one, three, like four, five, two or something. Uh -huh. Once like when you get to the two, then you have to keep on popping until you check the like until you get to the last value, which would be one. And then you put the other variables in like an array list in the order that you, in like I guess reverse order of what you saw them in. So you just push them back once you put two. Okay. So that sounds like it would be like an O of N operation though, right? Not if you wanted the largest value, because then you just check the stat. Okay. But like if you're, but we still want push and pop and everything else to still be O of 1. Well, wouldn't they still be O of 1? So you're saying that, so, okay, wait, so you're saying that you take your values, like 1, 2, 4, 5, 2, or whatever, and you pop the 2, and then... Well, you would, like, you can, up until 2, you would all just, like, you do the same thing, like, you just pop off the top to check if it's greater than... Are you talking about for the get max function, or are you yeah. talking about adding? Okay. Well, adding them, you would have to like I'm saying putting them in like a specific order when you're putting it into the stack, so that when you do use the get max, okay, the value at the very top. Yeah, sure. So like, what? Uh, so we want to preserve the initial order in which they were added, though. So does this? It sounds like this would change the initial order in which they yeah. were added, right? Yeah. So let's say that. Okay. Let's say that um, we wanted to have like a, okay, so let's say that we wanted to have like a list of like, um, I don't know, uh, 
trying to think of an example that would make sense. But basically, the idea is we want to be able to keep some sort of ordering such that if we were to like want to like read them out in the order in which they came in, we would be able to. Yeah. So every time we push something, can we add it to a set, and then we can use collections dot max for get max, and then once we pop it, we took it out of the set. Yeah. So um, that's great. But under the hood, um, collections dot max is still doing an O of n operation, going through every element in the collection. Yeah. Um, yeah. What if for every time you pop onto the stack, you have like a custom data structure that stores an integer as well as the max that was on the stack before? Yeah, sure. That that seems like a valid thing too, right? So like if we were in Python, we might be able to store like a tuple of like, oh, so here's like, here's the current value, and then here's the max value, which is the max between whatever was underneath it and the current value. So I think that your idea and Brian's idea are the two ideas that seem to make like that seem like they would be the most successful right now. So um, because Java doesn't really have tuples, they have like points and like they're kind of annoying to work with. Let's um let's try to work with Brian's idea in terms of like having two stacks. So what would that look like? Um, let's have a okay. So let's just have a public max stack. And let's just say that we have a uh, stack values, uh, which in this case we're going to just have integers. And then we're also going to have a stack of maxes. So in both of these, we're going to initialize in the constructor. So and. <coughs> All right, cool. So in pushing, what do we have to do, right? So we have to take care in like each of these. So let's just write it as if it were a regular stack first. So if we were to push, then we would just say values.push val. And then for pop, we would say return values.pop. And then over here, we would say return, well, we don't know, because a normal stack doesn't have this. But what do we do? Okay, so uh, public int get max. Well, hopefully at the end of this, we would be able to say return maxes dot. I think there's a dot peak method. I'm not sure. Yeah. Did I not import job that util? Yeah. Okay. Cool. So like I said before, dot peak is a method that's present in like some implementation of the stacks where you just like take a look at the top element without necessarily having to like remove it. So um, now let's think about how maximum values would sort of uh, sort of change the way that we do our push and pop functions, right? So it seems like it would make sense if we were to say if val is greater than uh, if val is greater than get max, then max is dot push val, right? So that way we would have a continual like stack of like possible max values. Same thing over here with the pop, right? So we'd say, so at the very end of it, we'd like pop the thing whatever from values. But before that, we would say if val is equal to get max or sorry, if values dot peak is equal to um get max, then we'd want to pop whatever it is from the max as well, right? So maxes.pop. What's one thing that's wrong with this right now? Yeah? So if you have multiple versions of the max coming on being pushed, uh -huh. um, it won't keep adding multiple versions of that to the stack. <coughs> yeah. So the first one that you remove removes the max from the stack. Yeah. Back to the old mm -hmm. one, even though there are multiple copies of the max still remaining. Yeah, absolutely. So you just change that to greater than equal. Yeah, that seems like it would work, right? So, um, let's uh, let's. Okay, that sounds awesome then. So, um, let's say for. Okay, so let's initialize a max stack then and see if we have everything that we need. Um, I know we didn't implement an isEmpty method, but 
we don't necessarily need to do that. Are there any other things that we need to worry about? Yeah. One thing, for example, if you have the numbers 1, 2, 6, and then 4, uh -huh. it adds 6, so 6 is the max. Then it goes, you go to push 4, but 4 is not greater than the max, so it doesn't do anything with yeah. it. And then when you pop 6, now the max it thinks is 2 when it should be 4. But the thing with the stack is you can only pop the last, the most recently added item. So you couldn't get to six before you like removed four in the first place. Or like when you're adding them to, like adding those values to the stack itself, not to the max. Okay, so you're saying I push one, and I push one to the max stack, to the to the maxes stack, and I push two, which also gets pushed to the maxes stack. Then I push then four, six. or then, then six, six, which also gets pushed to the maxes stack. And then I push. And then you push four. Four, which does not get pushed to the maxes stack. Yeah, so then, now let's say you want to pop the six. Yeah. The maxes stack will say that the max is now two. Yeah, sure. So I, I think that um, so the problem is right now the stack has one, two, six, and four, right? So you can't get to six before you remove the four. Like so, note how push takes in a value, but. Pop does not take in a value. Pop will return the top element of that stack every single time. Yeah, so that that's the beautiful thing about this, right? If we were like dealing with like an array list or something like that, where we could like remove like arbitrary items, then I don't think there would be um in o a, an O of one solution to like you know getting the maximum value. Um, it would just yeah, because you wouldn't be able to preserve any sort of ordering. Uh, with result with regards to that awesome so let's uh let's try to see if we can test this out a little bit then so let's say max stack and it's a new max stack and uh, let's push a couple of integers on there so for in i in an int array which let's say is like one two six, three, ten. Um, let's do m.push i and then let's print out the max value. And then let's say while m dot okay, let's actually define a is empty method. So while m dot is empty, while well, m's not empty, let's just pop them and try to print them out again. So uh, okay. So with this, we should expect to see the max of one, two, six, six, ten because um, we're printing it out every single time. And then while uh, m is, wait, return value, oh, sorry, public boolean is empty. Okay, so while m's not empty, then we pop it, and then we see what the max val is. So that means that the max val should go from, the max val that should be printed out should be 6, 6, 2, 1. Um, and one more thing, how do we want this thing to uh, behave when there is nothing in there? Right, so what do we want to do when we want to say, like, okay, what if we get the max of like an empty max stack? What is it then? That's a question that like you probably should be like asking your interviewer because there is no real right answer there. It could be zero, it could be int, Dot, like min val could be anything that you choose really so for the sake of this problem let's just say return it. if it's empty then return integer dot min value and if it's not then return whatever it is at the top of the max stack so as of right now we should in the order of like printing stuff out we should get six six two one and an integer dot min val 
So cross your fingers, see what happens. Oh, I compiled the wrong thing again. <laughs> okay, so let's run max stack. And that I got an empty stack exception. I get max. So over there, I got it at no push I. Um, so at this point, it's Okay, so we pushed, and we said if val is greater than or equal to get max, which is... Okay, that's interesting. We literally just need to flip these two lines of code, because at that point, values.push has already happened, but there was nothing at max. So as long as you just flip those two, we should be good. So let's run this. Yeah, and that's exactly what we got. One two six six ten, and then six six two one, negative minimum value of in, of integer. So that was max stack. Um, I think that's all the time that we have for this week. I hope they all learned something. Um, I apologize because I recently just switched to IntelliJ and I didn't really know how to use some of the things on there. Um, but I'll be around for a couple more minutes if you have any more questions. I know that this was probably one of the faster lectures that happened, um, just because I do think that covering linked lists and stacks in one lesson is like a bit ambitious. Um, we're actually going to finish up stacks next week with one last problem. Um, but yeah, I hope that y'all enjoyed this. Um, if you have any more questions, feel free to let me know.